Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic, and with us tonight, Annie Haslam. Annie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Now, I know some folks will know you from uh, the symphonic uh, rock band, Renaissance. Some folks may know you for your artwork, and we're going to get into both of those Mm -hmm. uh, things. But if I recall correctly, your life was actually going in a different direction than music, uh, you're working in uh, fashion, correct? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be a dress designer. And uh, I went to art school in Cornwall for that. Uh, but I, uh, funnily enough, I never painted except one watercolor. So it, what that painting of that kind was never on my mind. And yeah, I, I wanted to be a dress designer. Um, and I ended up in, in London. I before I did that, I had to get any job, basically, you know, to keep myself alive. And um, one of the jobs was working for a freight booking clerk. I was a freight booking clerk for the Far East. I didn't know what I was doing. It was like crazy. And it was it was in the city of London. You know, the city of London is only one mile square. I'm sure you know that. And um, And I was very close to Pudding Lane where the fire of London started. Very interesting parts of London, you know, very old. Mm-hmm. And uh, the people there were great, but I, I you know, I, I, and I didn't know I wanted to be a singer. I, I, I really, uh, well, I, I, I didn't know I didn't. It's my, my brother Michael was the singer in, in the family, managed by Brian Epstein, you probably know that. But um, yeah, so I, I did that when I first went to London and while I was still, uh, I, um, I was kind of a, a set, filling out applications for, um, a, to be a tailoress, you know, like a, working in a, in a, in a workroom, you know, not obviously not designing things, just as a, as a, what do you call a, uh, an apprentice basically, I guess. Um, so I did several jobs and I, I did, um, I, I ended up with a, a uh, a Savile Row tailor and I um, gosh that was wonderful because he, he used to he, he made suits for Patrick McGowan you remember the prisoner oh yeah yeah and s- as several other famous people and you know what I, one of my wishes and dreams and I don't I probably it's probably going to be in my next life now though is that people men wear terrible suits they're badly made they must buy everything off the shelf the sleeves don't fit they're all puckered up it drives me crazy <laughs> i'm serious i'm serious i'm serious and uh, i i get and i watch the award shows and I, the only one that was any good that was a couple of years ago was brad pitt was wearing something it was very nice but i did find fault with it somewhere <laughs> did because you want to know it's so different working for a Savile Row tailor. I mean, it's, and yet it's tailor made absolutely to your body. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, very expensive. But I think that if in in a in a, my next life, or maybe in this life, I don't know, um, is is to have a business um, with a Savile Row tailor, find a Savile Row tailor, and 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 build a business of you know the best suits. You, I mean, I just don't understand it. even the millionaires and everything and they come on and oh god it drives me crazy you know, <laughs> I up on that. i've got my friend kathy gallagher you know she she was here uh the weekend uh and um every time anybody came i said look at that sleeve oh she said shut up will you <laughs> every time I said, look, look at the back. it's always all punched up and the sleep and this goes back all the suits in like all the old films they're like laughable well, you're making I me mean, very glad I didn't wear a suit tonight. Made, like, but yeah, well, I would have told you. I, I always tell the truth. <laughs> to be honest, you know. But it, was a, it was a great place to work. The guy was wonderful. And uh, David David Coombs, he was called. And um, we were right around the corner from where the Beatles were playing on the roof. And I went round in, in, in the street. I didn't go up or anything. But I, I had no idea at that moment, you know, that uh-huh. I would be which i did later on 
But um, so uh, uh, what I did also was I was I worked for Jaeger, help, uh, learning to make patterns, something like that, and doing odd jobs and things, all the things you need to do. You know, it's like everybody mm -hmm. should be a waiter or a waitress, I think. It's a good way of learning learning about life, you know. But I agree. Um, yeah, and then I found this company called Winsmore, and I it was really exciting because they were taking me on as a trainee um, fashion designer, designing outfits, drawing fashion drawing. So little did I know. Anyway, I, I went there, I was really excited, and I um, the man who owned the company came in to say hello. He, he, was going out, he was going off on holiday somewhere. He said, I'm going to be back in two weeks. So I look forward to seeing you then. And um, what happened was they gave me a, a book, sketchbook, and they asked me to come up with anything that I could think of, you know, any designs or whatever. And I did. I came up with lots of them. And, uh, and then what they did is they took, Oh, that's right. And the guy who owned the company came in while uh, while I was sketching. He said, "Oh, these are really good. I like the way you, I like your style of drawing, and I like the designs, you know." And um, they took my book when he'd gone, when he'd left for his holiday. They took my book into their office, and they kept it in there for two hours. And when I came, when they when they came out, they fired me. They said I wasn't good enough. So what they did is they stole my designs. It I, was I had a feeling that's where that was going. Absolutely, Winsmore. That's what they're called. Never forget them as long as I live because it broke my heart. And um, my, I, I got home and I called my mom and dad and I told them the story. And they said, right, uh, well, you're going you're to come to Canada with us. I went to Canada for like three weeks, I think, to see my brother Keith in Toronto. And so that was great to do that because that was one of the first times without realizing it. I, I, I mean, I started – singing a little bit but not 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 no it's still not 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 that knowing and i was um we went to a, a a pub in toronto i've forgotten the name of it and um they everybody was drinking lager and they had a talent competition and so they uh, i chose i didn't really want to get up i was very shy and i got up and i and the Words were written on a piece of cardboard. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> Hopkin, who was married to Tony Visconti, who ended up producing my album and writing with me. It's like all mm -hmm. these things as a childhood all are coming out now and all, all through my career. Of all, like I met Paul McCartney, I met Ringo, you know, met, never met uh, John or George. Um, and so that was the beginning. That and when I got back, um, I started. Um, I had a boyfriend called Eric Peacock, and he um, he encouraged me to sing. He heard me singing at some point. He said, "You know, we we got to get you singing." So he put me in for these talent competitions, and in like the some of the old pubs in in London. You know, I don't know if you heard of the Cray Brothers. You heard of the Cray Brothers? Yeah, no. uh, just just a bit. Yeah, well, this is the kind of ne negative people, but very well known. And they used to go, they used to frequent these, these, these pubs, lovely old English pubs with the stained glass windows, you know. And you walk in, this, this smell overtakes your body, you know, smoke and beer, mainly beer, the smell of beer. And I had to sing in that, you know. And um, so I, I, I did really well in the talent competitions, and then decided uh, with Eric, we, we just, we got a And um, the first album that he bought or I bought was um, the first DLO album. And so I, en I ended up being engaged to Roy Wood. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's another thing. So many of these things in my life. You know, that, it, that I, you know, my mom and dad sent me for elocution lessons when I was 10. And I thought, what are they doing to me? What's this for? Could you talk about this, you know? Yeah, right. And uh, I went for about a year, well, nine months or something. They couldn't really afford it. It was a working class family, two up, two down outside, toilet and a coal shed. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they also let me go, before we moved to Cornwall, they let me go to a secondary art school, which was because they could see that I'd, I, I'd got some kind of thing going on there. They were wonderfully supportive of, of the three of us, you know. Mm -hmm. They saw what, what we could do and they just, 
enhanced it, you know, helped us get there. Um, but yeah, the design thing broke my heart actually, and, I, and then I ended up in probably a worse business, really. Um, but I knew it was for me, you know, eventually. Mm -hmm. So, well, at what point did you decide that music was the path that you were going to go? Um, around, I think, I think my, I never really thought anything might, was different about my voice. I only know my brother Michael's voice is a cross between Roy Orbison and Elvis Presley. And I think just seeing him must have gotten into me somehow. And my father was an amateur comedian singer. And I wish the age, the ages were different. And I was older then because I would have done something with my father's voice. He was, but he was just a dad and he didn't realize how brilliant he could sing and then my brother michael mm. got his voice and then i got the female version of it you know um but i would say around that time when michael it, I, 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 subconsciously again I, I guess but also my mother's sister auntie joan and uncle eric and my cousins all sang in light opera and they did all these gilbert and sullivan um operettas you know mikado roddy gore type pirates of penzant and they performed and lived um in buxton in derbyshire which is one of it's what it's just it's in the the derbyshire dales oh God, fantastic place and uh, there's an opera house there and what they did when i went for my holidays and stayed with them she had a wool shop and i used to go down there and serve people and fiddle around with the little boxes with wool in, you know, like little girls do. <laughs> <laughs> Never forget it. I had a bedroom with a steam train that used to go past. They were right, the track was right behind, right by my window. And, um, but I've lost my train. I thought, no, okay, we go. So they, I used to go to the operettas. They used to take me and they put me in this box and I used to sit and watch from the box. Now I would say that something was happened to me that without knowing it, because I was about 10, 11, 12, around that age. Um, I, uh, and then in 2015, we had a tour of England, and I got to, got to sit in the box, and we played there in, in the Buxton Opera. <laughs> wow. And one of the women in the daytime, I walked through, I said, do you remember a lady called Joan Swan? She said, oh, I remember Joan, you know. Yeah, I said, that's my auntie. Um, so that was, and I think that was, really quite obvious and then when I, I shared a bedroom with my brother Michael and, and Keith when I was younger and Michael used to have a radio and he used to play Luxembourg Radio Luxembourg and I, I used to lie on the floor and listen you know listen to him and he had his guitar and he'd be fiddling around with it my dad bought him a banjo first and then a guitar and then that the rest is history for him really yeah so um I would say it, it seems to have been in the family you know my auntie Joan my dad, my brother Michael, you know. As I say, it sounds like you're genetically predisposed to to be a vocalist. Yes. Yeah. And my brother Keith is he's a Krishna devotee, has been for like oh, God knows, 50 years, a long time. He's older than me. Mm -hmm. Um, but he is an unbelievable artist. So he had the he had this the the drawing and the painting skills. Michael Michael might have had something else, but he was a different, he was a very intense person. Um, and uh, I couldn't see him with that kind of side to him. But as far as, you know, the singing and everything was phenomenal. I mean, it was a gift, really. Yeah. yeah. And so we well, sang together when I was coming from breast cancer. Uh, we we were in his, his living room and I said, it was pouring with rain and I, I was, half an inch of hair on my head and I went to England for just to for a rest really and it rained nearly every day of course and I said can we record something and he said yeah he said I've got uh, he said we can record on a videotape I said really and this was like in 1992 three and I thought really I never knew that so he got a he had some karaoke tapes tapes which he used for messing around with and then he had a bare microphone that I'd given him and he'd got a, a guitar. We didn't need a guitar. We just used a tape and we chose somewhere out there. 
mm. from American Tale. And so we recorded it. It's on an album I did called Woman Transcending, which you can you can order on my my website, I think, somewhere like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely family stuff, I think. And my mum, um, my mum was a dancer, uh, but an amateur dancer, you know. She was a great cook. She was a very kind, loving person, you know. But my dad was very funny. He was he was really, really funny man. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> I think I get some of that from him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell you tell you what, Annie, you mentioned before that you had a chance to meet uh Paul McCartney. What do you remember about that? Oh my god. Well, I was recording my uh, solo album, Annie in Wonderland, with Roy, Roy Wood producing it. And we were at Delaney Studios, and we were in Studio 3, did most of the work on the album Studio 3, except when we used a choir and a brass band, and we had to use the big one, the big which Paul was using at, for a time. We went in later on. Um, and he was there with Linda and Denny Lane, and they were mixing Wings at the Speed of Sound. Um, so I thought, well, I'll probably bump into him somewhere. You know, I didn't go looking for him. I was a bit shy. and I get a bit shy around famous people. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and so um, although I could have said, you know, do you remember my brother Michael? Because, you know, they, they got up to mischief, you know, most of the time, I believe, from my brother, you know. Anyway, um, so we just finished uh, my vocal, my lead vocal on If I Loved You. And um, I came out of the the studio and into the control room and sat down and w we played it back. And as it finished, Paul McCartney said, "Who is whose voice is that? <coughs> and um, he came over and he said, that just made, I just got shivers down my spine. He said that was the most beautiful thing. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty amazing. So then we lost an hour recording time at the studio because he came in and he started talking to us. You know, it's like, wow. He had certainly had charisma. Unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that was very special. And Ringo, Roy and I went to, um, and we used to go to Trader Vic's. They used to have them over here, didn't they? And mm -hmm. it was at the Hilton on Park Lane. And uh, we went in there. And what you did is you go in. I, I love those places. You really felt like you were in Tahiti or somewhere. Um, so I remember going in with, with Roy and going straight into the bar and have a drink before, while you wait for your table, you know. And so we go in there and... Um, Harry Nilsson's in there with Ringo Starr sitting at a table. And he, Ringo sees Roy and says, hey, Roy, come over there and have a drink, you know, come over there. And um, so we sat down, and, and that was interesting. Um, I think they'd had a few, but it was, a very, it was quite amazing just to sit there and, and talk to them and listen to them, you know. Um, and then we went in and had a, an amazing dinner, uh, of course. But, yeah, that's where I met Ringo. I'd never met George or John. I'd love to have met both of them, you know. Right. Well, I think you did okay. Yeah. The other thing is my, when my brother was um, opening up for them um, in, in the 60s. Sorry, that's my little dog. She's got a cough. Um, they came to Plymouth, and we were living in Foy at the time. And I, let's see, how old was I? It must have been something like D15, something, whatever. And, it, and my brother was opening up for the Beatles. And we so we meet him outside the, the venue, and he said, why don't you come back and meet the lads? And I said, oh, I can't. I don't want to. No, I don't want to. I feel funny about it. A bit shy. <laughs> what a stupid twit, you know? Um, Anyway, my mum went in and my dad said, I'll stay outside with them. He stayed outside with me. My mum went in and met all of them. You know, that was ridiculous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Kinks were on that show as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was the Kinks. My brother, and I, there's, I think there's 
a, a tape. I saw it on YouTube and I, I don't know what, I can't find it again. And it just, show, it's very short and it shows my brother in this really slim mohair so which they wore in those days. And he looked fabulous, a very handsome man. You couldn't hear a word he sang because of all the screaming. Nothing. Wow. <laughs> you <couldn't hear> <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'll tell you, you, you mentioned your Annie in Wonderland album. Yeah. Uh, that album, you, you mentioned If I Loved You. I think that that track really stands the test of time on it's that really album. Wonderful. It's a beautiful song. Well, it's a timeless song. Well, I mean, it's Rodgers and Hammerstein. So, I mean, it's you, you can't really go wrong. But, you know, what you did in this goes. Another thing, Hammerstein's house is like two minutes down the road from me. Oh, wow. So that's another connection. Isn't that, it's like, I just realized that's another one. <laughs> well, you know, when that's the show is done, the viewer is going to be playing Connect the Dots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, uh, but no, uh, with, with how did you choose that song? And, you know. What were what was do you remember uh, what it was like recording it and what your thoughts were once you heard it played back in finished form? The whole reason I did it is because uh, I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to record something that my father sang with his Roy and Boy. He was Boy, and Roy played the piano. <laughs> and um, he did "If I Loved You" and he did "Nature Boy." That's why I did Nature Boy on there. Um, and, um, yeah, if I loved you, that I wanted to do it. Uh, and recording it, I think, what did I do? I, I think I went out and, and bought Roy a couple of balalaikas. And he and he put and he and he's playing the ballet like he learned how to play them because he can play anything. He's he like when I met, when I knew him, he was playing like thirty instruments, wow. you know, including the bagpipes that he played sometimes, which is awful, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> for half an hour before he starts playing any music, you know, very funny guys, you know. Um, so yeah, recording it was just. Oh my God! It was just, and and I love the key because I like singing low as well. I don't, it, you know, I'm known for singing high and operatic kind of sounding um, pieces and everything. But I love my voice when it's low down, and uh, and I just I just loved it. In fact, I think Roy Roy did a thing. There was it was called the Producers on BBC, and it was gosh several years ago now, and. Um, uh, the producer contacted me uh, to say that he was going to be doing this show. Did I did have any comments uh, about Roy because they were going to be doing this show with about him. And um, and uh, and what he did was uh, he was asked what was uh, what was his favorite song that he'd recorded. Um, I think by anybody because you know he produced a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And he said, "If I loved you, wow. Annie Haslam." which was really quite amazing because it was, you know, it was like a national show, BBC, and, and I thought, oh, wow, well, look, listen to that. And then I thought, yeah, if you listen to it, it's, it's, there's hardly anything on it except the, just the beautiful music. There's nothing, there's nothing to take your attention away from the song at all. And the backing, you know, is fantastic. You know, he, he did a great job with that. Yeah, absolutely. Say, if I, ironically, the two songs that your dad had done were the two that have stuck with me. Now, uh, you mentioned the Bella Laika. Uh, that really adds a unique sound to Nature Boy. Yeah. I remember being you know, well, familiar. Well, that, with, well that, no, the Bella Laika was in If I Loved You. That's right. That's right. Anyway, yeah. but, the, but but the the arrangement and the sound on Nature Boy oh, yeah, the gorgeous. was so distinctive. Yeah. You know, that's really strange you should say that because, you know, that was another song. And, of course, I love Nat King Cole, and he did a version of it. But I just was um, contacted by somebody. Um, and I never really, you know, my mind is so full of so many things that I just, I don't have like a day off to look into who wrote this song and, and, and who was this person, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and Eden Arbez is the man that wrote 
wrote the um, the song, and I was a, a con. I, what, how did I do this? Yeah, no, I got an email from somebody just uh, saying that they contacted me because I um, I was one of the people that sang that recorded Nature Boy. And uh, uh, they were doing a, an Indiegogo thing, which is going on now, actually, because they, they've do, they're doing a film, a documentary. It's fabulous. It's so interesting. And um, it made me, he was, uh, this man was like a, a poet. Uh, 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 just some of the things that, that are written down, if you, you know, go, go to Indiegogo and look it up, or but I'm not sure where else it might be, but is the story of his life and and but i got this terrible yearning that i wanted to meet him but of course he's been dead for a while <laughs> you know <laughs> i have to go to a who you know <laughs> and, um so i but i got i was so attracted to everything about him and i really wish i could have met him um and and this it shows him in this it, he was like really out there and i'm a i'm, I'm a bit of a nutcase myself you know and um and I'm proud of it, you know. It's just the way I am, you know. That that my dad. I think that my I got that from my dad, really. Um, but it it, it, it shows him in in the the little. There's a, like a, a trailer for it, and it shows him with Nat King Cole and all these people that he worked with, and he wrote three hundred pieces of musical together. This man, I had no idea. No. And because uh, I, I, I really, I'm, I need to get a day where I, I want to go through and have a listen to all the other things he's done, like brilliant instrumental music as well. Mm -hmm. his, his poetry is fantastic. My God. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah. What a song, though! Oh my gosh. Well, <clears throat> the first time I've done scat singing. I'm sorry. What was that? Uh, and, and that's the first time that I I did scat singing. Do 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 okay. do, 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 do Yeah. And then, then of course, so when you do something like that and record it and you do it live, you got to do it right, you know, on stage. And I thought, am I going to get? I'm going to do 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 do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you have to do it right. It's, otherwise, you shouldn't do it, you know. But I, t I learned a lot from Roy in the studio, as I did with Tony Visconti as well. You know, both really clever people in the music oh absolutely oh wonderful yeah. i mean both both very inventive yeah. oh gosh yeah there's no doubt there yeah so i'll tell you what we actually got to kind of jump forward in, uh, musically there to, to annie in wonderland uh we prior to that we were kind of like leading up to you joining renaissance how did you wind up joining the group um well, at first, my first job, oh, my little dog just rubbed against my leg, sorry. Um, my first um, so job was, um, I did the, the uh, talent competitions, and I was still with Eric, my boyfriend. And so we thought, well, let's, you know, you really need to get this you know, a full-time singing job. So we saw this advert for somebody in a, a band, a cabaret band called The Gentle People, and they worked at the showboat in the Strand, which was like a dinner theatre Really quite exciting, actually, that was. I'm so glad I did that. Um, and I, I, they fiddled the auditions so that I, I would be the only female singer that turned up. They, they saw me, and then they wanted the, the owner uh, or the, the one, the big man, boss in, in charge, wanted to see, you know, to make the choice. And they fiddled it so that I was the only one that showed up. And I got <laughs> But it was it was fabulous. I mean, I, had, I wore a, a mini dress and silver silver shoes and false eyelashes. I remember singing one night, my eyelashes were starting to come off, and I thought, <laughs> oh, and my mom and dad, my mom and dad came up from Cornwall to to because they were living in Foy then. They came up on the train and they came to see the show, and um, somebody told me that they heard him. Um, I don't, I don't know, it was a waitress or some, what, somebody had said that your dad, they saw, saw him and they're on this table. And when I'd stopped singing, he turned to the people on the next table and said, that's my daughter. She's better than Barbara Streisand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the, the best one is we, when we lived, we lived in Cornwall and I used to go and visit and I think it was, we did Carnegie Hall in 75, I think, didn't we? <coughs> and uh, I, I I went 
I'm down in Cornwall after I got back after that tour. And there's a lovely old um, beach, not far from Daphne, where Daphne de Mora here lives, at Menabili. That's another story. I met her as well. Um, uh, and there was a pub called The Ship Inn, and it's uh, the beach is called Paul Keris, very small, you know, beach and everything, lovely. And um, it, they've got pirates' caves and everything underneath the place, you know, it's really old. And so we go in for a drink, and my mum sits down at the table, and I, I'm at the bar with my dad, and he's about two feet away from me. And you don't need to shout, do you? <laughs> really. He said, Anne? What was it like singing in Carnegie Hall then? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the floor to swallow me up. <laughs> he was very proud, my dad. I was just going to say. Yeah, they did get to come to the Albert Hall as well, which was, you know, that was the icing on the cake, really, that one. Mm. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I did the show about the Strand for about nine months, and the guitar it was a guitarist, uh, a drummer. It was a small drum kit, if I remember rightly, but I wouldn't have known any difference, except now I do when I see the drum kits, you know. Um, and um, a guitarist, a drummer, and the bass player was the one in charge. And so it was just three musicians and me. And we did, you know... Dancing in the street. By the time I get to Phoenix, have I an Aguila? Have I had a, had a tambourine with with ribbons on it? And um, it, it, I just loved it. I, I, it, we did a, we did two shows in a night, like not real shows. Like I, I would say maybe twenty minutes, thirty minutes, bef while people were having dinner, and then after the main show. Uh, we'd go out for people to dance to. And um, th that was, you know, if, if there was something funny going on in the dance floor, like somebody dancing really badly or something, the, the guitarist would look at me and do a nod like, you know, like, it's time to laugh now, you know. <laughs> well, I couldn't, I couldn't stop. <laughs> you know, you, he, he was terrible. You could see his, his shoulders were going up and down with the, the laugh. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! Stop it! <laughs> and um, so that, but I enjoyed being there. One day, he said to me, "He said, Annie, he said, I've, I found this advert in the Melody Maker, and I think you should go for it. And it's uh, for an international, an internationally known pop group called Renaissance. They were looking for a girl singer. And so I, I, when I got home the next day, I, I um, called them up." the the management and they said that the band were in Europe and they were coming back a couple of weeks and you know could you go and, uh, buy the album and, and learn the songs I said no no problem so I got the first Renaissance album and learned everything on it back to front and um, they asked me to sing Island and I knew it and I loved it so much mm -hmm. and you know I said to Mickey all along for many years I said we've got to put this in the show because this is the the song that got me the job you know um, and we never did. And so in the end, you know, when in 2000 and when was it 17, when we was we, we decided that we were going to get the the orchestra together and, and put my paintings behind. It was like two big giant wishes come true um, that we were going to do Ireland. And we did. And then this for this last one, which was 2019, um, we invited Jim McCarty, who wrote the song with Keith Ralph and Beethoven, I think. <laughs> beautiful piece. Oh, it's just so beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's another thing that came full circle, you know. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, so much stuff, really. Yeah. Exciting, well, you know, uh, we've done it. Yeah. So that's uh, – well, I, I went for the audition, as I said. I was wearing a, a long um, a Bieber tapestry coat to the floor my hair was parted in the middle and I got some dress on I mean I wouldn't wear anything like that now you know I looked like I was going to a funeral but that's the way they dress then isn't it um and um I just I got the feeling I was going to get it as soon as I walked in because I could tell they were looking at me and they felt something you know and then as soon as I started singing that was it and I got the call the next day New Year's Day 1971 wow what a way to start the year. Yeah. 
And actually, within three weeks, I think it was, we were in Germany touring. Wow. Now, what was what was that like? I was now... <laughs> <laughs> You don't say. <laughs> oh, God. I, I remember I was taking out the, the, the management. The guy who managed us then was called John Michel. He's a very nice man. And he, he and uh, somebody else took me shopping and bought this gorgeous dress. Oh, I wish I had that dress. And I just to have it you know it was chiffon and velvet and it was just beautiful and um yeah we well gosh we played it we did a lot of shows um and then let's see yeah we did a lot of shows i was i was like so scared that i was holding my hands like this you probably see a lot of the old photographs i was mm -hmm. like holding on to myself you know and i did that for quite a while and um you know, there actually, is a, there's a, a video on YouTube now, 74, in in a the studio in Luxembourg, and it's it's great. It's this it's great quality and everything. And I'm holding my hands like that there, 74. So that was three years after, and then all of a sudden, slowly they they came apart. You know, and uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, we 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 did some great shows, and we actually did the Paris Olympia. The you know, early on, mm -hmm. and some of the shows are actually brilliant, um, and beautiful, beautiful venues. And then when we came back to England, if we were doing anything, we were slogging up and down the, the M1 and the M5, you know. Um, it was a whole different story then. And, and have you got money? Can we share share the gas here? Got petrol? Have you got, give us five, give us a fiver, you know? Um, that was. Uh, we worked our way up very quickly, I would say. But I remember that at that time, it was very tiring, and and some we didn't didn't have the hotel, so we'd have to drive all the, all the way back and things like that. But um, we did that for a while, and at that point, you no, know, I there were six people in the band, and Terry Crow was the lead singer, and I was really like a backing singer, except I had, I think, I had two songs to sing: Island and. Um, beautiful song called face of yesterday and that's another one i think i might like to record at some point it's oh it's just gorgeous um but i wasn't the lead singer and there were six people in the band um and it changed several times uh with different people falling out and and everything and, and then all of a sudden um our agent at that time was the john sherry agency in london and ed bicknell was the main one who um was was our booker and uh then miles copeland came into the picture he brought wishbone ash into john sherry's um stable there uh and um and that that's when i started going out with miles and had a two-year relationship with miles what miles did with us was he fired everybody in the band including michael dunford and uh it was just myself and terry um and john tout and but we kept Mike, Mickey on Michael Michael Dunford as a writer because his his writing was phenomenal, you know, and so was Betty's. You know, the, the two of them together were like fantastic. And so we had all auditions, and we had brought. I think the first person that that we brought in came in was uh, John Camp, and then um, we were looking for a drummer, and then Terry Sullivan came in, and, and it was just magic then it was magic and um we, we first album was called prologue um and we had actually we did have a guitar we had electric guitar we had rob hendry and he was on the prologue album and he did tour a little bit with us but it, it didn't it didn't work out it was better to have a, an acoustic guitar really and so mickey came back into the fog and then uh, then we recorded Ashes of Burning and, and every album was like so natural, so easy. It was like they were just it was just a real natural progression. You can tell it, you know, with, with the and then novella, you know, and all the, it just it did change a bit, you know, get more dramatic or whatever. But um and then we made a big mistake, I think, you know, in, in 1980 when we did the um, we had Northern Lights was a hit from Song for All Seasons. And then we did after that, no, did we do Shahrazad and other stories after Song for All Seasons? 
you would probably know more than I. I yeah, actually, that was that was uh, Shirazan came out in seventy five. I thought. Okay, and so Song for All Seasons was the last one, the the, the, the next one, and then um, then the As You Adore and things. Well, there was pressure from everybody, you know, the management and everybody, because Northern Lights was a hit. You know, you need to start yeah. writing more more commercial you want hits. You want you want hits. Yeah, you can obviously do it, you know. But but well, you know, when we did when we did Northern Lights in the studio, uh in Delaine Lee actually, which is where I did my solo thing with Roy, and I learned a lot from him and he, he you know, with the Danny in Wonderland, I did a lot of things with my voice and treble tracked it and everything like that. Um the the things with Renaissance were more like choral things, you know. But um, when I when I used my voice tracking and everything, but when we'd finished Northern Lights, we were listening to it and it was just wasn't something was missing from it. And I said, "Oh, I've got an idea. Like, can, can we can we treble track my voice like I did on you know what Roy introduced to me? You know, I didn't want to do it because Roy's stuff was so commercial, so different, and I, uh, and I was I didn't know whether I wanted to sound like that. But of course, it was me singing, and duh. So it was I, I accepted it, and of course, it was amazing. She said modestly, and uh, <laughs> I said that to the guys, I said, "Let's let's treble track my voice all the way through," and that's it. Just mm -hmm. lifted it, put the sparkle on it. That was it. Got to number seven in the charts. People say ten. It got to number seven in the charts. That was brilliant. Well, you want those other <laughs> three positions? <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, we were in. Uh, we were doing a, a tour in America, and somebody came on. Uh, um, when we were doing sound check, he said, "Hey, you lot!" He said, "Just got a phone call. Dave Lee Travis is playing Northern Lights, your record of the week charts." Wow, it was amazing. Yeah. All right, now with the with the with the group, Annie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's personnel changes and the, the sound of the band, you know, progressed uh, as, as time went along. Was it, did it feel like, like a natural progression that, yeah, we've done this, so we're going to add to it, make it bigger, make the songs, the songs more ornate. It was just a, it, it, it was just a natural progression every time. It wasn't, you know, it was, wasn't planned really. Uh, just from remembering the rehearsals, you know, Mickey would say, well, I've got this melody, and then John Tout would, would add melody. He jumped out, didn't get enough credit, actually, on the, that he should have got on the, on the artwork and things like that. But, you know, that's just the way it is with some bands. You don't get, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, but, yeah, the, the, it was just not – yeah, I remember – going to the rehearsal where was it in a place called little chalfont and there's a it's a chalfont near here actually great indian, like indian food anyway um and um the studio was it, there were two barns and we were in one and jethro toll were in the other and then of course i ended up going doing something on stage with him didn't i and he's uh, on his uh, rubbing elbows tour. He, he contacted me and said his favorite song is Northern Lights. Can I join him when he comes into town? You know, and I think it was at the Scottish Rite in Collingswood, actually. And that was an experience. And then, of course, when we did um, the Grandi Nail Vento album, and uh, Jason Hart, who was playing piano on, and keyboards on that, along with Rave. Um, he came up with this fabulous flute part and he was playing it. And I said to Mick, I said, I wonder if Ian, because I did, I, I did, you know, I, I, did, I didn't, I wasn't paid for, you know, when you do things like that, you don't get paid for it. Mm -hmm. it it's, um, you know, you experience. Do, you fellow, yeah, your fellow musicians, you know. And uh, so I thought, oh, I wonder if he'd do it for us, you know, for free. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, of course he did, you know. And uh, I think it's just gorgeous what he did. Oh, cry to the world, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, you talk about doing things with with other folks. Mm -hmm. Steve Howe, yes, on his uh, Dylan tribute. The tell us about that because that's yeah. that was just a wonderful version. Yeah, I, I, I started off singing. Um, 
when I started off listening, started off listening and realizing that, that, that when I was doing the um, talent competitions and I was listening to, at art school, I was listening to um, Joan, Baez, uh, Joan Baez and uh, Bob Dylan for sure. Um, and, um, and Joni Mitchell was another one. Uh, but yeah, I, I had a, I've got a Joan Baez song book up there. And that's in there, and and I and he said he was doing this album, and would I, you know, would I sing "It's All Over Now, Baby Blue"? Because it's perfect for me. And um, oh, I enjoyed that. That was great. Yeah. Um, but that I, when I did that, that that's the day that we. we I, I was over there at his place in Devon. We were writing songs together for for an album, and um, we got to do about. I don't know, six songs, I think. Uh, but then he got a phone call from John Anderson and they, they got Yes back together. And Sadly, you can't do everything, you know, uh, timing. It was timing, right. really. Yeah. So, but so, uh, um, well, apart from that, we did write the beautiful song Lilies of the Field, Lilies in the Field, you know, for that um, charity um, concert I put on with 20th century. Irving Plaza, and that was amazing. We flew Roy in. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, and, and and Gary Brooker. We flew him in, and uh, we had uh, Justin Hayward there, Tony Visconti, and we had mm -hmm. um, Al Franken <laughs> was there as M partly part MC. You know, oh, it was mm -hmm. brilliant. Yeah, Phoebe Snow. Oh God, that that was and and then of course the the, the we we named the concert Lilies in the Field, and. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. yeah. It, it was great. His voice and uh, you know the guitar was just fantastic on the other songs that we did, but you know they didn't see the light of day, sadly. Um, but you know that you it wasn't meant to be. And also, of course, I did stuff with um, with uh, John Wetton and mm -hmm. uh, Jeff. In fact, Jeff Jeff and I just wrote a song um, for. Um, there's going to be a, a box set coming out on the life of John Wetton. And um, so he, it, we wrote a song together, um, and that's going to be probably coming out maybe later this year, not until next year. You know, I think everything slowed okay. down because of of the COVID thing, you know, and everything like that. But right. yeah, I, John's voice was just phenomenal. I mean, he was a great bass mm -hmm. player, but something in that voice, you know, something right. in the tone of his voice, like my brother, something in there that you can't put your finger on it. There's nothing like it. Exactly. It, it kind of reaches right down into you. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. And so there was, there was John, and then I in in the seventies I did something with Pete Townsend and and Phil Collins, but it was actually Raphael Rudd who became a keyboard player in my solo band, and and he was in Renaissance for a short time. Um, he, I got a, I was living with Roy, and I got a telegram saying, um. Um, we have Raphael Rod at the studio in um, Eli, Eel Pie Island um, in, in London, Twickenham, I think it was. And he said, I'm, <clears throat> I'm producing an album for him. This, And it said, uh, he asked for you, he, he wants you on the album. Uh, are you interested? Um, please get back to us, Pete Townsend. <laughs> I thought, well, ah, Pete Townsend. <laughs> you know. And, like you're uh, gonna say no? I, I, yeah, I thought. Well, I thought for like half a second, and <laughs> and uh, contacted him and, and went down there, and, and and that was quite an experience. You know, you know, I mean, wow. And he's got, a, you know, to sit and talk to him, like just like as a person, rather than doing an interview or anything like that. You know, like well, I can't, can't, you know, it's on the same level, really, being a, a musician in a way. But he was, he's another one. Like, a certain kind of charisma um, about them that are special, things that are special. And then Phil, Phil was there as well, Phil Collins. He was brilliant, you know, what a nice guy. Oh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, and this, the, I can't remember the name of the album. My memory's really been bad. Worse since the COVID thing messed me up so badly, you know. That, um, You're not alone. Yeah, no, I know. No, definitely not. Yeah. So. Well, tell you what, we, we mentioned uh, Annie Wonderland, another one of your uh, solo works, Still Life. Oh, yeah. 
Tell us about that album. Well, I was uh, cleaning my little cottage one day with a vacuum cleaner, and I had some classical music on in the background. I could still hear it, and then I was cleaning and dusting things, and I was I was singing along, and I thought, oh, oh, wow. And I was coming up with words, and I thought, oh, God, what a great idea. And I thought, I don't think this has been done yet or done properly, you know. So I contacted Betty. I said, Betty, what about this? She said, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, I could, it, she, you know, for her to do the lyrics as well. And um, it, it, she said, let me call Lou. I like, you know, I'd, we'd already worked with Lou on Annie in Wonderland, but also with Renaissance, you know, arranging and, and conducting the orchestra stuff. And so I got hold, she, called, she called Lou and said, um, what do you think? And um, he said, yeah, absolutely, no, no hesitation. So that, it, that was amazing because around that time I got a phone call when we were go, actually recording and uh, I was due to go in this particular day. The day before I went somewhere else and, and what it was, I, was, I had a phone call from um, – he was in, he is, this guy used to be in Climax Blues Band. And I can't remember his name. Isn't that awful? Again, I, it's, I'm, yeah, I, him. I apologize. Yeah. And he was, anyway, he played piano. Uh, what he said was, he said, and this is always get mixed up. Um, is it Ken Russell that did the, the um, produced, directed the, the, the musicals in London? Yeah, I believe so, yes. Ken Russell. Ken Russell heard your uh, single of um, that I did with Mickey and Pete. We, we did this spin-off thing called Nevada, and we did a couple of singles, and we did one of them was a Christmas single in, in the bleak midwinter. And um, he said he heard your voice on the radio and wants to give you an audition because they're looking for a new lead in Blood Brothers. Now, I'm not an actress. And um, I thought, well, it's silly. I need to. I need to do it, you know, just for the experience. Even if I don't get it, I need to. You know, you don't say no. You just try. So they sent me a script, and I thought, oh god. And then, you know, they said I needed to. My accent had to be Liverpool accent. I thought, oh god, how can I change? I, I could do Birmingham, but I don't know if I can do Liverpool. It's not that far away, but it's different. Um, and so. I, I I learned the parts and and I learned the song was beautiful. It was not in the perfect key for me, but it was beautiful and it was one of the it was a famous song from Blood Brothers, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a big opportunity if I got mm -hmm. it. But then I would have to be an actress, you know. And of course, I'm deaf in one ear. <laughs> you know that. So I don't know how that would have fared, you know, in, yeah. uh, uh, on on a, a big stage with. You know, um, but I knew what I was comfortable with, you know, from what I what I did with with Renaissance and orchestras and, and stuff. So they, they said, you can come to we'll do the audition. We won't do it in a theater, you know, with lots of other people. We'll do yours just on your own, just you. So they got this studio called Pineapple Studios and it's in in London and uh, in the heart of the West End, actually, I think. And. <laughs> I got that. It's a very famous dance studio with people. And so I, I think I had to walk up five flights of stairs. No elevator. I got to the top and I was so nervous. Oh God! And I go in there, and there's these people sitting in a semicircle. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! Oh God! Mm. Take me away right now! I want to disappear. <laughs> there was Ken Russell. There was um, now there's. James Fox, Robert Fox, it was Robert Fox. You know James Fox, the actor? Mm -hmm. You know, there's three brothers, isn't there? And I think this was Robert Fox who was in 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 the in theatre. He was there. He was, he was sitting there looking gorgeous. And so was Ken Russell, actually. And then the guy who was the choreographer was drop-dead gorgeous. And, and, and just I was, again, it's really, really odd, you know. And then there was a woman there. And so... I walked in and, and and they said, "Are you ready?" I said, "Could you give me five minutes?" I've just walked up five hours. <laughs> and uh, apart from the nerves, you know, 
and it was you know i don't even have ever been in that situation you think oh god why am i this is awful how can i get out of this in any any circumstance you don't know what to do you know right and um so I went over to the guy and he says, hi, Annie, you remember me, Clarence? Yes, I said, yeah, and he, he was in theatre then. He moved moved from rock into to theatre. And so he started playing it and I started saying, I think it was Ken who said, you know, I think you, should, you need to drop the key a little bit. And they did that. And then I was fine. I knew I could sing it and I, I knew they would like my voice because it was different and that's what he liked about my voice, I'm sure, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, so I, I went over and th and they said, <coughs> the, the gorgeous choreographer guy, no, the, who he's, he was did the screen, screen, the scripts and things, so he wouldn't be a choreographer, would he? I'm not sure. Anyway, whatever he was, the gorgeous one, the extra gorgeous one, really. <laughs> looked like a movie star. Well, you're that good looking, it doesn't matter what you do. He was pretty good looking, I tell you. And... Um, so he was, they said, what we'll do, because, you know, we can say, you know, we know that this is very different from you and you feel like a fish out of water probably. So we'll, we'll leave the room and then we'll leave you with this guy. And um, so I'd got my script there and I thought I was going to throw up. <laughs> I, I just inside you know and um and he said so okay so you're i can't remember who the, the the lead was and so you're i'm gonna i'll be this person and i'll be speaking to you you can reply to me and i i, I didn't do anything i said i'm sorry i can't do it i didn't even i didn't even attempt it i said i'm so sorry i said i i i'm terrified and i really i don't think it's for me and they said they didn't you know they said don't worry about it it's fine you know i mean they found somebody, obviously, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. uh, and then the next day, I was meeting Betty Thatcher um, at the hotel that we were going to be staying in while we were recording with uh, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in Piccadilly. I met her there, and then I think we got a taxi to the studio. And I walked in, and I knew all the orchestra, <laughs> knew everybody. Walked in, and it was like you know, so familiar. It was wonderful. Hi, mm -hmm. Annie, how are you doing? Hey, yeah. It was amazing. What a treat! What a gift! You know, mm -hmm. there I was. I was in my element, really. You were home. Wonderful. Yeah, never forget. Yeah. That. Well, with that album, uh, Shine. That was a, a really nice. Once I was lonely living in dreams. Shine. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Because on that, uh, the title track, Still Life, uh, Shine, uh, Bittersweet. Isn't, isn't that Jim, the one Jim Nopardy? You know, I don't recall. I think it is because uh, um, when I've done a couple of things with my keyboard player, Rave, he plays it on piano, and it's that he plays that. It's it's Jim Nopardy. Okay. He's, yeah. Say, but the, those three and chains and threads. Those are the ones that have stuck and with me. The, the I didn't. Part. I had the third one. Oh, uh, chains bittersweet. and threads. Bittersweet was the third one. Oh, bittersweet. Okay. Um, what was the other one? Still uh, life. The, the final the final song on the album, uh, chains and threads. Oh, that's brilliant. That's Wagner, isn't it? Yes. In troubled times, I am aware. Oh, the voices on that. Oh. Mm -hmm. I, I cry when I, I mean, when we did the first thing with the orchestra, first orchestra with the Renaissance, me and John Tout were both crying. You know, it's like, oh. and it was, this is the same thing because it, this was like a solo thing that was just an idea. And here it is, you know, mm -hmm. amazing. Oh, yeah, it was. What a, oh, that's fantastic. What makes me laugh about orchestras, though, is you know, um, it's choirs, but not, not uh, but, but um, players as well, is that, you know, they're so, they, they read, they can read music. I can't read music, I can't write music. I come up with ideas and then I'll sing them, you know. But they'll, the women will take knitting, knitting, you know, knitting there, when they're not doing that, they're knitting away. Tap, 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 Lou, you know, right. And, and then they just, Sit there and start playing all the ah, you know? <laughs> and then they get back down. They go, no, they're knitting away, or they get a book, you know. What's in the news today? They open the paper up, you know. <laughs> it's great.
Yeah, that oh. was a fantastic um, experience. Never forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what what are some of your most memorable uh, experiences recording? Well, I think the one, the Paul McCartney one, was the was the biggest of all. I think, um, but um, well, it's kind of hard to top Paul McCartney. Well, it is. Um, uh, uh, oh, well, another one that well, you you probably don't know this guy. Anyway, but I, I, it, it was it, somebody else um, who was at the studio, Delaine Lee, was um, Ken Dodd. He was a comedian. But that, okay. that, that, but it's somebody that I saw watch growing up, and all of a sudden I'm talking to him. He said, what's your name? I said, it's Annie Haslam. I'm in a band called Renaissance. And he said, where are you from? I said, I'm went, oh, Mrs. Trollope. And from then on, when he saw me, she's Mrs. Trollope. <laughs> you know, people in England would laugh at this. <laughs> but you're not, are you? Anyway, you can cut this out if you want. <laughs> oh, God. Who's I to say people aren't watching in London? Yeah, I mean, there's just some incredible experiences, uh, even with recording. Um, oh, when I sang, when I did uh, um, my album, um, my epic album on epic records and um i i wrote a couple of pieces on there but and then um I michael kaplan who was as the was the president then of you know the a and r department said we need to bring in somebody you know who, who do you know that you can bring in um to with a song you know that and is who's, who's well known and i thought well i, I could contact tony visconti uh, um, this is before Tony and I wrote together, but I, I met him or co I contact, contacted him and he knew me and I can't remember how we met before then, but I contacted him and I said, I'm trying to get hold of Justin Hayward. Um, would you, be, would you be able to help me? He said, sure. And so he contacted him and, and uh, he came up with this song for me, The Angels Cry, which Agnetha from ABBA had recorded already. and. Um, so he gave me that song and um that was that was the album that larry fast don't you know larry fast is a very close friend and, and, and brilliant um it's difficult to know what his music is what, what what would you he's very unusual what he does what do you call it? it's electronic music but it's melodic electronic but uh, and anyway i've known him for years and and i chose him to the to produce the album um and um what we did was um i asked oh that's right when we when we heard the song we just all melted you know um and the arrangement that uh, that uh, larry did was phenomenal on it um and then of course well we really wanted justin to to sing with me and i thought oh <laughs> Ah. <laughs> and I had to stand on a box because he said, uh, Justin said when he got there, you know, and he played some guitar on it as well. But he, um, when he got there and he was in the, the box, you know, he said, I think we should do the vocals together. And I, oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, God, please. And um, so I did have to stand on a box because I, the, because of the microphone. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh gosh, that was an experience. That was what that was wonderful. It's a highlight, uh, absolutely. Uh, he's another one with a just a god-given voice, you know. Oh, absolutely. And, and and the songs, the writer, you know, gosh, not a talent. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was another great one. I'm working with, um, I, you know, I didn't, I, I did record with Steve Howe because we recorded Lilies in the Field, um, but that wasn't with, but. Again, another great experience because he's one of the best guitarists in the world. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. So I've been very fortunate, you know, to work with these amazing people, really. Um, and um, yeah, it's a shame that we're the the um, and obviously the pandemic has affected everybody all over the world. Mm -hmm. And for us, it it you know lost two two years work. 
plus the momentum that we've been building up right 2009 and then we had to rebuild it when we lost michael you know that was very sad and we had to build that up again you know and we were just it, it was really working really well and then all of a sudden we were about to go to brazil we were rehearsing i was leaving for brazil two days after rehearsals mm. and um so we, but we found out the second day well we knew you know when we got the alert that peru and chile and argentina had closed their borders, that's when we decided we're not going you know then we lost right. the german the night of the Prague in germany um we lost uh, i was going to um headline um the in Gu Gouveia in portugal the the prog rock concert there weekend with patrick moraz both of us doing that lost that you know the Chris, my christmas show everything but it was the ment momentum really and, and right it couldn't have happened at a worse time because i was winding down you know what i was going to be doing this year and um but we're, we're, we're looking at they, they want us to go to brazil again next march it may happen it may not don't know um and also germany is is back on the night of the prog so headlining that would be good yeah, headlining it. Yeah, we're, we're doing headlining the Friday night and uh, Steve Hackett's doing the Saturday night, but we're just going over for one show. Mm. You know, it's not easy. People say, well, why can't you play here? Well, it's not as easy as that. Plus, I don't know whether you're going to have to pay because of all the different restrictions now with visas. I don't know what it's like over there, mm -hmm. you know, for that now in that area. Yeah, so say the the one upside, yeah, uh, for you since you have been able to tour is you've been able to devote time to your artwork. Yes. So, uh, tell us tell us about your artwork. I know you do acrylic on canvas. Mm -hmm. And and tell us, you know, uh, what your inspiration is and uh, what have you with with your artwork. Well, I st I, I had my solo career and I, I started to wind that down in two thousand and two and i thought oh dear what am i going to do and i thought well i'm a good but i can't write music can't play an instrument can't read music you know which i think you know for anybody that's that's starting out now you, you should you, you've got to learn everything right now don't don't hesitate and also get a proper job mm. you have to have a proper job and um so i was in my den one day and this voice in my head said it's time to start oil painting now i'd never done an oil painting and it was as clear as day and i thought i'm gonna take i'm gonna do that i knew this happened several times a voice telling me different things and mm -hmm. um, so i bought everything necessary and i i, I I had a sunroom. I've got a sunroom here, and it's all glass. And I converted it into a studio and bought easels and paint. And I did oils first of all until I realised I was slowly killing myself, you know, with the fumes. Um, but I didn't paint anything. I got everything set up, and I thought, well, because it wasn't time, and it was like another two months, I think. And I woke up and I thought, today's the day. And I went and picked a tiger lily. I bought a book and oil painting, but I don't read. I'd read one, one, one page and I thought, I can't be bothered with this, so I'd put it down. And so this was the day and I got the canvas and I got this tiger lily and I thought, I'm not going to be painting flowers. I don't, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing at all. Um, and so I, uh, and then where do I start? Because I didn't read the book. And so... I thought, well, I'm just going to have to wing it. Just, you know, you can't no just learn yourself, teach yourself. I started with the sky and, the, and, the, and then the, the, the grass. And when I was doing the grass, I felt somebody holding my hand. And it was all curves. And then the next painting I did was all, I thought, I'm going to do all grass. And I felt this hand helping me. It's just called grass. And then after that, um, uh i did a painting and it was all it was red pale blue and i wasn't picking that oh well i'm gonna use blue for the sky and red for this and that. i just was i just chose 
Okay. That's all I can tell, explain it, really. Um, almost mm -hmm. like somebody else is working through me or whatever. And so it is. Um, what happened was during this painting, I, a little spider comes down um, on, on a thread right in front of me, about six inches away from my face, and it was red. It was kind of a, a darkish red, but bright. And then I went oh, like that. And and that, that moment when it disappeared, my studio filled up with the smell of pipe tobacco. And it was there for months and months and months. Couldn't get rid of it. And I knew who it was. It was Vincent van Gogh, and he was the one that was helping me with the hands. And the wow. sky looks like it, it looks like he helped with the sky in that painting. Wow. And then the next one was a UFO on, on, on an ocean, hovering over an ocean, and then... From then on, uh, all the ones, a lot of my early ones are different planets and landing strips in different places. And, uh, you know, I paint these little beings, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know where they come from. I don't think, oh, I'm going to write, I'm going to paint a little alien now, a little alien being. Don't think at all. Somebody wrote to me once on Facebook and said, you've got a form of synesthesis, synesthesia, sorry. And, uh, you know, that's the people that can smell color and things like that. And there's there's some people that can tune in mm -hmm. to different things without even thinking about it. Well, you think about it, but it's gone because it's, it's it, I, first of all, I get this, it's, it's a, a little bit of an anxious feeling uh, before whatever happens to my psyche and my spirit. Um, and it, it just pours out. I don't, I, I never know what's coming ever, ever, ever. I, unless if I do a, a commission, I've got, I'm doing a port, pet portraits right now. And you see the background yeah. is, is like my art, right? Mm -hmm. Then. Oh yeah. Aren't they lovely? Yeah. So it takes me a lot longer to do the animals, you know, obviously. Um, and then this one came to me. I, I didn't paint. I, I wasn't feeling. I did a couple of paintings over the, the, the year, but not much. But, but then I, I had this feeling. Uh, I was going to do somebody's painting that I needed to do. And it's, it turned out, I, it's like this one just pushed its way in. And, and this is, is, is it, I was painting myself, actually. That's what I was doing. So I, I called it, see, the the top of it looks almost like a fre fresco. I, I don't know if you can see it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is it clear? Yes. And that's my heart in the middle. Oh, okay. So I called it Healing the Heart. Very nice. Yeah. And so this is another one. They're all different. This is another one. Very nice. Now, the the, uh, the viewers can, if they go to your website, yeah, they can see some of your paintings and they can purchase the paintings through your website, yeah. correct? Yeah. This one's for sale on my website, yeah. And I also love to do commissions because I, I don't, I keep saying it's not, it's not a challenge. It's not, it's just that, I'd, so like this pet portrait, I mean, I know the guy and I've seen his photograph because I've done work for him before, but um I ask people, like, I can paint songs. They can see, if they go to my website, they can go and have a look at painted songs. And I've done three Northern Lights, and they're all different, and they're different because I ask the people um, to send me a photograph um, and, of themselves, and I look at it. I don't need to look at it for long, and it just goes in, and then I paint their feelings towards the song. Okay. It sounds really odd, but um, they've all come out different, and it's because the people are different. And the pet portraits, oh, God, I love doing the pet portraits. I've done quite a few now. Uh, um, and, I, uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I painted musical instruments, uh, um, via, painted electric violins for Mark Wood. He's uh, He was in um, Trans-Siberian Orchestra for a while. You probably might know him, and he started mm -hmm. his own violin company making violins. And I've done quite a few for them, um, but yeah, I just there's nothing like it. I I can't explain 
how I feel. And it's, I think it's my way of meditating because when I, when I paint, everything just, you know, when you meditate, you've got to empty your mind. And I do right. when I'm painting. But I don't get this thing like, oh, you've got to do this here, do that. I don't. It's just like it just comes. Never know what's coming unless it's a commission. Um, I did somebody's house. Somebody, somebody, uh, uh, it's on my Facebook page actually. And he has Lamar. And it, I thought, oh, this. Is, and I th the first thing I thought, oh, this is going to be a challenge. And I got anxious. Thought, no, stop it. You, it's not that. It's you. You're just preparing. You're being prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And he gave me these pictures of where he was. He and his wife uh, were retiring to in um, Vermont. That's right. And it was all the leaves. It was thousands and millions of leaves on these trees on this these two hills, and then a, ri a river running through it, and then this house. And I, you know, I, I when I think I've got to do lines, I think because my hand wants to go like this all the time. You know, it's it's, it's all, it, everything flows. But in the end, I got it. <laughs> it took me forever. I think we might have lost a couple of windows because <laughs> <laughs> it came out fantastic. And a lot of my paintings have got all these other things in them, like couple, people and animals and all kinds of things. I mean, that goes for, for a lot of people because you can, you know, have you got a, that kind of mind, you can, you can see all kinds of things. But, um, but I, 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 I do. I love it. Yeah. Um, I did one for Dolly Parton um, because oh, wow. a friend of mine was a stage manager, for, yeah, stage manager for her, and um, uh, he, he was. Oh, I, I know. He was in a band called Star Castle, and they were doing a show at the at Rosfest, which was in at the uh, that theatre in um, Phoenixville, where they did the Blob movie. You know the Blob. That you know mm -hmm. that's, that's where they all run out because the Blob's coming after them. Right. Right. Yeah. Well. Um, it, that the show was there, and I, they wanted me to sing, and that's where I met him because I was going to be singing with him as a guest. Okay. And then I met him at, at the rehearsal, and then he told me that you know he was stage one of the stage managers for for Dolly, and uh, that that really thrilled me because I I just love her so much. I mean, she's such an incredible spirit, and so he told me that she, I, I thought I, I immediately said I got to do a painting for her. I just got a feeling, and she, he said that she loves butterflies. And so I, I, I sat down and I just, she liked lavender. That's right, lavender. So I had lavender and white. And I did this this painting and, and it's got these these things in that, that look like a surreal kind of butterfly. And it came out beautiful. And um, so I went to a show and, and um, to, to give it to her. And I got backstage because uh, my friend, and it what an experience! Oh my God! Oh, I, just just when she just before I met her before the show, which doesn't usually happen when you, you don't usually meet the artist before a show because you're usually in a different place and you just need right. to you know. But anyway, we were there just me and Pinky and, and uh, 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 Judy, I think the lady. Um, anyway, we were standing there and she comes over and. It was like watching an angel walk. You, you couldn't. It's like she was floating towards us. And I, 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 I broke out in tears. I've never seen anything like it. It was like an angel coming towards me. And she came and she had a picture taken with us. And she stood by me and she was so tiny. I couldn't believe it. She's so tiny and then like think you know you put your arm around and she's like she's gone. You know that small. <laughs> she was lovely. She was so nice, but she hadn't got the painting then. Anyway, we saw the show and during the there was a, a break. I came backstage and I, I I didn't actually give it to her because she was she went up into her dressing room you know just for some quiet time, but it was taken into her and she opened it up. And then when she came out, I was sitting on a flight case with my friend Pinky and a couple of staff there. And she said, who's the person that, that, that painted this for me? Who is it? And my, my friend Pinky pointed to me and she came up and she put her arms around me. And she, she, she was so thrilled with it because I think most people want things from you when you're a star, you know. So it's that, but that, that's not true. I mean, people do give presents and things. Most of them you don't get because you don't know if there's anything in them that's going to be harmful. Right. You know, so 
the reason she got it and she probably hasn't seen any anything for a while was because it was you know i was a friend of of Al's and and that and it, it was all vetted you know and the the tour manager looked at it and checked it out and everything but mm -hmm. what an experience yeah she's she's got it hanging up wow yeah, what I love. I mean, it was just a joy. And she's so wonderful. She's well. She put her, a lot of money into the Moderna vaccine, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Yes, she did. She does a lot of. She do, yeah, and she does a lot for children, and uh, she does a lot of things. Her book program is just absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, so. it was it was a great show as well. Yeah, and, and what an amazing body of work that she has. Some huh. of the songs, and the thing that amazes me is. How many great songs over such a long period of time? Yeah, I know. And the songs that you wouldn't, you, if you didn't, you didn't know that she wrote, mm -hmm. you know, big hits that somebody else had a big hit with. And you think, oh, who wrote that Dolly Part? Really? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, tell me, tell, tell me this. We, we've talked about some of the folks that you have worked with. Yeah. Who's somebody that you either haven't had a chance yet? To, to work with or didn't get the chance that you would have liked to have uh, recorded with? Uh, oh, I'd have to sit down and really, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, um, there was one time when I thought I'd like to sing with Jose Carreras, but, um, you know, I love all, they are all, all three tenors. Um, Pavarotti and um, Placido, is it Placido Domingo? Oh God, mm -hmm. he was when we were doing one of our albums in Abbey Road. Um, he was in the big studio, and he was conducting. I think the Royal, uh, the London Symphony Orchestra, maybe or the Royal Philharmonic, and he was in there conducting. And I was dying to go in, but I couldn't. It was kind of a closed session, you know. <clears throat> but yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a go. At, because when when I went to Sybil Knight, the singing teacher for for nine months, she said she wanted me to go into opera, and I said I, I don't want to do that. I I, I really um, I don't want to be stuck in one place, and um, I wasn't completely deaf in one ear at that time, um, but uh, I I just yeah, she said I really think that's it would be perfect for you because your voice is different as well, you know, because a lot of a lot of singers, a lot of singers, a lot of singers anywhere, any kind of music, they sound the same. A lot of people have, you know, and then you get people that have got really different, really different voices. Whoa! And you never forget it. And, and mm -hmm. usually they're the ones, if they've got the right music behind them as the vehicle for the voice, then they're going to be, you know, they're going to be big. Yeah. Now, one thing, Annie, that has always struck me was how you never got to record a Bond theme. Because I think your voice would be perfect <laughs> for a Bond theme. You think? I think so. You only live twice. You know, I'd love to play anything. And, and that's why I love to sing standards, you know. Um, when, when I did the album with Rave, um, to raise money for the Tinicum Lutheran Church. The, their roof was coming apart, and that's where I used to do my Christmas shows. So we did a, a, a fundraising and did a concert. We sold out in the church. I took all my uh, lamps from home to light the place up, and it was wonderful. It was, uh, and, and I, cho I chose the songs that I felt, um, you know, put me, put me on, the, on the path. Uh, you know, um, I did uh, Tit Willow from the Mikado on a tree by a river, a little of Tom Tit. Oh, that's Angel joining in there. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's got a bad throat. Uh, yeah, so to, uh, did, and then um, um, what did, what I did If I Loved You, Nedge Boy, and I did um, One Hand, One Heart. Um, I did She's Leaving Home for the Beatles. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's on the playlist, the Beatles playlist on Sirius Radio. Yeah, and, and that was from the Some Enchanted Evening album. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, that's, um, you can get that as a download on my, 
uh, go to my um, uh, website as well. So, Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I, 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 but I do love doing standards. I, I love it because, you know, I, I don't try and sound like anybody else. I do it my way, you know. I did it well, my way. <laughs> 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 really, isn't it? Everything you said is a song. Yeah, you, you, your next album. There you go. That's your uh, your closer. So I did it my uh, way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, as, as we're talking about uh, uh, recording and, and songs, we we haven't even gotten into the the new 50th anniversary box set. Oh yeah! So we should probably discuss that. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it was inevitable; it was going to happen, really. And um, we we're very fortunate because we have the best fans on this earth that have really stood by us and supported us for so long. They're brilliant. And um, so we, we did um, a, an Indiegogo project um, and we decided to fly over Jim McCarty. We decided to use the orchestra. Um, our agent got us uh, some a couple of extra um, shows with the orchestra. So I think we had five shows at, at this time. And um, we, we decided to use the Keswick Theatre. We've, we've played there many times. And it, it, it's, you know, the people there are fantastic. And so that, that was a pleasure to be there again, you know. Um, and then I decided, I, I wasn't sure about my art, whether to do it. And I thought, no, I've got to, I have to do it again. It, because when we did it in 2017, it looked amazing. But we were doing different songs. So I chose different paintings, you know. Um, but yeah, it was it was quite an experience. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, it's not a problem. But in a way, it was. Mickey and I used to say it was a problem that whenever we toured, it was so difficult to choose the songs because, you know, you can't go over two hours really. If you do, mm -hmm. you can't go much further. And a lot of the songs are long, as well. And so some of them don't have many vocals in them, you know. So you have to be careful. And you've got to think about what did the fans want to hear. So last time, 2017, we put Mother Russia in because we always did. This time we didn't because we wanted to put Running Hard in, you know. So there were so many to choose from. And, you know, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do another tour next fall. Um, it may be the final one. I don't know. Yeah, I mean. I can't, I'm not going on stage with a stick, <laughs> you know, and I, for anybody with a stick, I don't mean that to be rude or anything. I'm just saying I, I, I can't, if I'm not fit, you know, and uh, if I've not got my five octaves, I wouldn't do it because a lot, a lot of people do and the voices have dropped, you know, and, and are different. You, you've got to, if, if, you're the, if you're the lead vocalist, you've got to do a great job, as simple as that. But yeah, it was it was a and we didn't do anything about uh, we we did it in the fall 2019 and then we were going to start, I, I went to England in January to edit it and then came back and then we started rehearsing uh, for for the the Brazil tour and then when I came back we were going to start working on the packaging for the DVD and do all that you know but that never happened because once the pandemic hit. I think everybody w w I, I was so shocked by the. It was like, why is this bad movie going on? What is it? It was like it wasn't real, was it? It was. Mm, it no. was awful. I cried every day. I still cry. You know. Yeah. And I know people in in India, um, and um, uh, close friends in in Brazil, and a couple of those have just got it. And so it's like it's not it's not gone away yet. In fact, I spoke to my sister in law. Three days, I said, well, so you're all out of lockdown now. She said, no, they've just gone back in. We're back in for another month. Mm. I didn't know that. It didn't show it on TV over here. That which I found very interesting. It, was, it wasn't mm. anywhere in the news, but my, my sister-in-law said, to, like three days ago, I think it was, I spoke, three or four. She said, no, she said, we're back in again. It's that variant, the Delta thing that's doing it. So... Anyway, uh, there's a lot of music that needs to be heard. I mean, people need to go and see live music. Uh, and uh, that was the hard thing of, of not being able to to do that and, and to stay home and 
you know, climb the walls. <laughs> and paint. And paint. Well, I didn't say I didn't paint so much. I, it, I, my heart was breaking. Yeah. Because of the loss, the loss for everybody, and the loss that all the momentum that we'd built up for so long, gone in a heartbeat. Yeah. So. Well, you know, hopefully. you know. I mean, yeah, I'm still. No matter what, and hopefully next year, um, it would be you know go to Brazil. If it's okay there, and and then to Germany, um, and. Um, I've got my Christmas show coming up in, in uh, at Sellersville. I usually do every year. I missed it last year because of the pandemic. But mm -hmm. that's always fun. There's a lot of laughing in that. Laughter is a good thing. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Annie. Well, tell me this. Is there anything, any stone that we left unturned? Well, we didn't talk about UFOs, but that's another time. Well, what, what, let's let's talk about those. No, 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 no. It, 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 no my brain's going. <laughs> well, in that case, we'll save it for next time. <laughs> my brain's going. There's so much, you know. This, this just, gosh, it, 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 you know, one thing, and then it sparks something else, you know, in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, you know, but, the, but I mean, there's some great people out there that love music, and I'm sure that they're going to be there to support their bands uh, as much as they can, and. Um, you know, I look forward to being on the stage again, really. And uh, I, I love painting, so if anybody's interested in, in a commission or anything, you know, it's um, there's some good stuff on there. It's, it's, I don't know where it comes from. It's very yeah. different. Well, you, 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 if I remember right, you described yourself as an intuitive, abstract expressionist. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's difficult to put it into words. You can't really. I mean, if you, it's abstract, but it's got it's got movement, but it's got more in it. I mean, you know, not not everybody appreciates any kind of art. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some people get past, oh, it's abstract. You know, they can't see anything more than that. Oh, oh, I like that one. It'll go with my sofa in the lounge. You know. <laughs> I'm just looking, you know, don't see anything except the color. But even so, if it's painted with good feelings and a good heart, which I, I think my artwork is when you look at it, then it will they'll get they'll get it, but they won't know it. Right. You know, somebody somebody came to a show that I did once. The, my first show, it was at Image Makers in um in New Hope, Pennsylvania. And um my first show. And I had uh, 26 paintings in there. And this guy came in and he said, um, he said, I really love this, but I, I just I, can't, I just can't afford it. And I felt so bad I wanted to give it to him, you know. Um, but you can't do that. Because right. otherwise you'll never, you won't survive, you know. But I said to him, I said, just stand and look at it and you'll take it in. It'll be inside you. Mm -hmm. You know, because you could see he was like he was really overwhelmed with it. And but now, if I if I if I'd have thought about it then, but that was my first show, I would say, well, give me your name, you give me your name and address or your email, and I'll send you a, a print of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do now. Right. So, well, you have that going forward. Yeah. So, all right. Well, tell you what, since I think we've uh, covered pretty much everything, and we're going to save UFOs for for uh, for your next time here, we will uh, wrap this one up. Uh, we've had Annie's website scrolling across the bottom of the screen, so you can go there to see the info on music and art and everything else, all things Annie. So please do that, uh, Annie. Thank you very much for being with us. Oh, it was very enjoyable. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> all right, everyone. Well, on that note, we will wrap this one up. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media, is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. 
We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking. Starliner Media.